It's My Nerd World and Depeche Mode, the podcast on this week's episode. More making of Memento Mori. Some thoughts from producer James Ford as he talks about making Depeche Mode's Memento Mori. I'll give you my thoughts on the Primavera live stream that took place uh, last week. And we'll get to your listener feedback. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd World. It is My Nerd World, Depeche Mode the podcast, and I'm your host, John Justice. Hope you are doing fantastic. Got quite a bit to get to this week as the band continues their tour in uh, Europe. We'll talk a little bit about the live stream. Um, from uh, Primavera in Barcelona. That was an interesting one, and I'll share my thoughts here in uh, just a bit because I have uh, I have thoughts. First off, uh, let's dive into um, a bit of interesting uh, interesting news relating to the boys from Basildon. This was making the rounds on uh, Twitter earlier this week. I won't spend a lot of time on it or share my thoughts on the broader conflict between Ukraine and Russia. However, according to many sources, including on Twitter, uh, the article I have here in front of me, how the Ukrainian military appeared to launch its spring offensive with a Depeche Mode song. Words are very unnecessary. They can only do harm. When a video appeared on the social media pages of Ukrainian defense minister Olensky Rezikov, no one had any doubt when, what he was referring to. The slickly produced footage showed a montage of soldiers putting a finger to their lips in a request for silence. Posted alongside the Depeche Mode lyrics, words are very unnecessary, they can only do harm. The 35-second video published on Sunday evening had only one other caption placed in its final scenes. Plans love silence. There will be no announcement about the start. It said, presumably speaking of the start of the long-anticipated so-called spring offensive or counterattack against Russia, which has now crept almost into summer. So again, I wanted to share that with you without commentary about the broader conflict of what's going on, except to say that prayers for all involved, and I hope that there is a resolution sometime in the very, very near Uh, future. Depeche Mode for Spirit. A lot of it felt like marriage guidance counseling. Uh, This article comes from Music Tech, and they pull from a new interview with the NME, where producer James Ford reflected on some of his best and worst memories from his respected production career. One band in particular, Depeche Mode, was mentioned twice for holding one of his favorite career memories, but also one of his most difficult. My favorite memory was working on the last record, 2023's Memento Mori, which was weird to make because we'd all signed on and heard demos, and unfortunately, Andy Fletcher passed away unexpectedly, which was a big shock for everyone involved, Ford explains. I wasn't expecting the record to happen, but Martin and Dave thought the best thing to do was to carry on making the record. It was very bittersweet, an an interesting experience. In the, light of, of a, in the light of a brush with mortality, Martin and Dave were repairing their often um, fractious relationship, and it felt like long-lost brothers. They were catching up and reminiscing and talking directly to each other. They even wrote a song together. Then, when speaking on the album, which was his hardest to produce, Ford says, the hardest was probably the 2017 Depeche Mode album Spirit, because everyone was in a horrible place, The mood was strange, people weren't getting on, and a lot of it felt like marriage guidance counseling to stop the whole thing falling off the rails and the band splitting up. It was pretty grim. I am dying to hear the backstory of Spirit. Typically, when we talk about difficult albums to make, we immediately are pointed to Songs of Faith and Devotion. I recently watched the documentary again from the remastered uh, discs that were released uh, many years ago. Um, and a bit uh, from Ultra as well, as Dave was still uh, dealing with his uh, with his demons. But given what both Martin and Dave, and specifically Dave and now James Ford, have said about the making of Spirit, I really hope 
that sometime in the future that we get some details of uh, what actually happened during the production of that album. And perhaps that's why we didn't get a, a making of the production of that, uh, you know, a, a making of documentary. Uh, but again, we didn't get one for Delta Machine either, which seemed a bit strange. So I'm just I'm dying to know the backstory of that. And for a band where we typically know quite a bit about the uh, music making process, it is a bit surprising that we have yet to hear uh, the reasons why uh, those albums were so uh, difficult to make. <laughs> All right, so earlier this week, gosh, when did this when did this um, air? Was this last weekend? I guess Um, I totally uh, I totally forgot. Okay, yeah, so this was on Friday. I had to go back and look. Uh, This was on Friday. Depeche Mode uh, would be performing in Barcelona at the Primavera Primavera uh, Music Festival. Times were screwy in trying to figure out when they were actually going to be uh, live. I was able to watch a good portion of it live and then caught uh, the uh, the last few songs and the encore on the clips that were posted on YouTube uh, shortly uh, shortly afterwards. Um, in the absence of getting an official release for this for this tour, which I would imagine at some point we are going to get, um, I'll add that uh, apparently they have gone and added a new uh, movie or video footage for when they replace Speak to Me with My Favorite Stranger on the tour. Typically, this happens when they're doing multiple nights. Um, They had been showing the Speak to Me footage with My Favorite Stranger, I believe, and now there's new Anton Corbin footage of... Well, I won't say what it is for those who don't want to be spoiled, but apparently there's a new video that goes along with the screens for uh, My Favorite Stranger when they do make those, uh, those track changes. The set list for uh, Primavera was um, shorter, not surprising considering it was a, a festival, mostly taking out the Memento Mori songs, unfortunately, but again, not surprising considering that it was a um, it was a festival. So, uh, listen, I really enjoyed the, the, the live stream. In the absence of not having an official release, I will take this, for the most part, over the footage that's been placed online from um, the fans, some of which has been quite good. Uh, but this one being more professionally doing that thing with my fingers produced, I enjoyed uh, quite a bit more than I did the uh, the fan footage. That is until the camera work decided to go and try to get clever, and I just don't understand why they do this. My wife had sat down with me, and I don't remember which song it was. It was fairly early into the set, but they started doing quick cuts that were timed with the beat of the song. And it wasn't bothering me that much. It was bugging the daylights out of my wife. And she ended up checking out. I mean, she was actually kind of getting into it. And then when that started happening, she's like, I can't follow. The cuts are too quick. I'm out. I'm, I'm out. I'm leaving. That wasn't so bad. But as they got further and further into the set, suddenly now they were working the cameras and putting effects on it. And I felt like I was watching some of the... Uh, footage from the Playing the Angel tour, from the official release from that tour, which was specifically shot that way by U Bowl. I understand that. I mean, they they specifically shot that performance and put the effects on it. That's because they wanted something different than what they'd done in the past. I, I get it. But for this being a live stream of a festival event where they were focusing almost exclusively on the band members, right? There was there were not a lot of wide shots showing the images on the background. And again, I was fine with that. I was happy to get a live, somewhat professionally shot um, you know, performance out of the band. I thought that the band sounded great. I thought the audio sounded great. I just got really annoyed later on as to why the camera work decided to get clever because it didn't look good at all. They started doing weird effects. They started putting filters on it. Um, They got into, I think, a pain that I'm used to, and the cuts were just so fast. It was just chaotic. There was also some issues where a couple of the cameras, it looks like the cameras had gone out and it it went black for a while. So apart from that, I really enjoyed it. I thought the performance was great. There's, uh, I believe, some listener feedback here um, that uh, is talking a bit about how the band sounded. I know there's a there's some subjectivity to this. I thought personally that they sounded better than what I had seen 
from previous videos of the tour earlier in the tour. This sounded more to me like Dave was on point and on key. So from that standpoint, really enjoyed it. I will probably be watching it again, but I'll be honest, some of the faster tracks when they get into I Feel You, when they get into a pain that I'm used to, it was just the camera work was just bad, and it was completely unnecessary and honestly ruined what could have been a really solid live-streamed uh, performance. I just seems very odd to me. I, I don't watch a lot of other festivals <laughs> and other shows, so I don't know if this is par for the course, but for that, it just did not work for me we do have some commentary that talks about this did it work for you let me know talk show nerd at gmail.com or leave a comment on youtube if you happen to be watching there be sure to like and subscribe too to whatever podcast platform that you enjoy or um on um on youtube uh, like and subscribe there as well all right let's get into your uh, listener feedback uh this week first we hear from tanya Tanya writes, finally had a chance to watch the documentary last night along with a 10-minute Q&A with the director's producer and Alan that came up on YouTube. It was so good. Thank you for mentioning it. I enjoyed it immensely. I found it absolutely fascinating to see these people from all over the world that are just as deeply connected to the same songs, words, melodies, and images that I am. The guy in Iran and the friend group in Moscow really moved me. The German family dressing up was slightly creepy, but very creative, and that kiddo was adorable. The young guy dancing outside the Rose Bowl had all the moves down well. That was impressive. I'm so happy you recommended this. Thanks again. I also had a chance to catch the replay of the Primavera Sound Show, or at least the watchable parts. Wow, I thought I was going into strobe blindness. Exactly. I also thought Dave sounded a bit like he was fighting a cold or jet lagged at times. Interesting. He was amazing, as always. Just worry... He's resting his voice and not uh, just worry. He's resting his voice and not overdoing it. They still have a lot of shows to do before they come back to the states. Definitely don't want to jeopardize um, those dates. Uh, thanks again and take care, Tanya. Uh, thank you, uh, Tanya. I appreciate that. Uh, Johan Jorgensen writes: Wagging tongue does indeed sound like a, a music for the masses track. As I was uh, mentioning. Uh, last week on the show, how I've kind of come around on that particular song. And I appreciate it for its, I don't want to say, um, it's not minimal, because I think the production is done very well, but just how it's very concise. Um, and the same thing with Caroline's Monkey. I, I know that early on when the album was released, there were some individuals that were complaining the songs weren't long enough, but I actually think that with 12 tracks on the record, it hums along quite nicely and benefits from the tracks being a bit shorter. Uh, they just they, they really get to the to the point. Uh, the ones that are need to be a little bit longer are, but the other tracks they just they they do their thing and then you're on to the next one. I think that really benefits the overall vibe of the album itself. And thank you, Johan. I appreciate the um the comment. Lars Guthell writes the longer I listen to the album, the better it gets some of the greatest DM tracks in the last twenty five years. I agree. All right, let's get into a uh, fan spotlight uh, this week. <laughs> Haven't done one of these in quite a while, and we'll hear from Danielle Monette from Montreal, Canada, who writes, I just started listening to the Peshma of the Podcast, starting with episode one. And in it, you're inviting listeners to write to you and share your own DM experience. Uh, no one in my life right now shares my appreciation obsession with this band, so I was compelled to do so. Um, as I know that you will get it. A lot of what you shared is very similar to my own story, especially in the early years. I'm a little late in the podcast game, so I don't know if you still read any of the emails, but here it, uh, here it goes. I do. The first Depeche Mode song I ever heard was Blasphemous Rumors. I remember exactly where I was and how it made me feel. Summer Camp of 1984. One of the camp counselors was playing Some Great Reward, in one of the common areas, and I happened to walk into and just stopped dead in my tracks. Back then, I was 13 years old and barely spoke English. I'm French-Canadian. But something in the song, the combination of the unusual sounds, the intensity of Dave's voice, and the rhythmic, and the rhythmic chorus woke up something in me. Up to this point, my musical tastes revolved around top 40 pop stuff, Madonna, Prince, Duran, Duran, Wham. But this, this was like nothing I'd heard before. This music had depth. 
This music had meaning. This movie was this music was raw with emotion and energy. Nothing about it was candy coated. I was completely hooked. I quickly found out who the band was and the name of the record and went out to buy it as soon as I got back from camp. It didn't take long for me to acquire the previous albums. I started to spend all my pocket money made from babysitting and cutting grass on their records. When Black Celebration came out in 1986, it came as a surprise to me. There it was on full display. I had no way of knowing when the record was coming out. It was in the indie store that I frequented. I fell even harder for them. I was also impressed with the whole aesthetics of the album, and I believe it was what inspired me to become a graphic designer later on. I cannot pass over the fact that I was a hormone-filled teenager. I was also not um, in, insensitive to the boys' looks. Dave was definitely my favorite, still is. I even wrote a whole novel with a friend. We call it fan fiction today. I was ahead of my time. But our adventures on the road with the band after winning a contest to accompany them on tour, again, ahead of my time, 101 ripped off my idea. The Black Celebration Tour in 86 was the first show I saw. They had come to Montreal in 85, but I couldn't go as the small venue they played at was also a bar and only accessible to people 18 years and older. For the Music for the Masses Tour in 87, I scored front row tickets from my cousin who worked for the concert promoter. For a 16-year-old fan, it was a dream come true. This incredible feat also gave me the reputation at school of being the ultimate Depeche Mode fan. Then came Violator and brought them to near-god status in my world. They were getting better and better. I just couldn't get enough of them, pun intended. In 1990, I moved away from the family in the suburbs and to an apartment in the city. In the process, I sold my whole DM vinyl collection, three milk crates full of LPs, remixes, and rare imports. I pretty much had every release at that point. I knew I wouldn't have the space to store all of this uh, all of this in my new place, and I thought, it's okay, I've got everything on tape cassettes anyways. But then CDs came out, and my tape collection became obsolete. I don't have any regrets in my life, but one of them was definitely parting with my vinyl collection. I saw the band in concert, both on the World Violation and Devotional Tours. That last one was memorable for me in a good and bad way. The Montreal concert for that tour was the one where Dave lost his voice about four or five songs in. Martin stepped in for a few songs. Dave had the crowd sing more than usual, and the whole set was cut short without encores. But this was also the night that I got invited to a post-show party in Martin's hotel suite. There I was in a crowded suite with my idol. I was so starstruck that I couldn't find the courage to talk to him. Plus, by that time... He was totally wasted. During the following years, my interest in their music slowly faded and my attention went elsewhere. I still listened to their new releases and saw them again in concert in 2005 after a friend invited me to tag along. Anything they released for the past 15 years or so went under the radar for me with not even a listen. I was a fan no more up until recently. I was referring to them as my favorite band when I was younger. They were a part of my past. When I heard the news of Fletch passing last year, I was very moved. I felt a part of my youth had died as well. Then talks of a new album followed, and suddenly, probably because of Andy's death, I was ready to listen again. I bought tickets for their Memento Mori tour, thinking it could be my last chance to see them live. Then Ghosts Again came out, and there I was. I was hooked again. That song reopened a part of my soul that always belonged to Depeche Mode. Memento Mori is like a love letter to their fans, old and new, and I'm so there for it. Since then, I've been basking in DM magic. I was excited to see their whole catalog available on Spotify, and I mean whole. I've listened to remixes I hadn't heard in more than three decades. I've reunited with old friends and discovered new favorites like Wrong. As I have a different perspective on life at 51, I've watched every single footage, interview, and video available on YouTube, and I'm amazed with all the content I can find online now. 101, Spirits in the Forest. Live performances from the 80s and then some. I discovered a whole community of fans on Facebook, and my search of all things DM led me to your podcast, which I have close to 100 uh, 100 episodes to look forward to enjoy. I've come to realize that Depeche Mode is my favorite band and will be for the rest of my life. No other music fills me with as much joy and energy. Thank you for entertaining that and wanting to hear from people like me. There's nothing in this world better than being gotten by someone, even... If you've never met them, a humble and forever devotee, Danielle Manette, Montreal, Canada. (laughs) 
Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. I'm, I really do appreciate it. And I, I, I honestly hope that the that you listening um, enjoyed hearing that as much as I enjoyed reading it. That was the first time I'd actually uh, read that. I typically uh, don't go and preview a lot of these emails unless they're short ones. Um, but this one I wanted to wait and just read raw on the show. And I'm very, very glad that I did. So thank you for that. All right. That wraps up the show this week. As always, I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, people often ask, how can they support the show? Do I have a Patreon? No, I don't have a Patreon. But if you are a new listener to the show and uh, you enjoy reading science fiction, that is my other love, uh, I hope that you will go and check out my science fiction space opera series, Embark. Now, we know you love Depeche Mode because you're listening to this podcast. But if you do read sci-fi, I hope you will treat yourself a friend, or a family member uh, with science fiction. The story is set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture. It's inspired in part by Depeche Mode, life in the so-called space age, the world we live in and life in general. Depeche Mode plays a large part in the underlying themes of the story, and the main character himself, loosely based on me, is a massive Depeche Mode fan at a time in the future when the music of the 1980s through the 2000s is nostalgic and popular among the characters of the story. Think Ready Player One. The stories do feature references to your favorite band, both direct and indirect, while telling an exciting science fiction space opera saga. Book one is as follows. Katha's father died one year ago. Yesterday, he gave her the key to saving humanity. She just doesn't know it yet. Taft Guardia picked the right day to upgrade his ship after fellow pilot Katha Mara received a cryptic message from her late aerospace engineer father. What he thought was a routine investigation quickly turns into a dangerous journey of discovery and survival when an industrial accident sets off an apocalyptic chain of events. As a corporate madman with an armada at his disposal attempts to gain control of the global evacuation, they discover what may be the only hope of stopping him. Now the clock is ticking as Taft, Katha, and a ragtag squadron of pilots fight to save Earth's evacuees from annihilation and secure their future among the stars. Embark is a fast-paced and action-packed space opera series. If you like your science fiction to be epic, filled with some romance and action, then Embark is perfect for you. Now, it's written for adults, but it is great for ages 11+. plus. I wrote this because of my love of Star Wars and wanting to write a space opera series myself. I wanted something that my uh, boys, who were younger when the first book came out, um, I think Kyle, who's now 16, when Embark came out, he was uh, 11, 12 years old, um, and he and his buddies really enjoyed it. They are written for adults, but they are great for ages 11 plus. In terms of uh, violence, um, you can put it on par there with what you would get out of Star Wars. Uh, no hard sec no hard sexual scenes and certainly no language at all. Uh, you can pick up Bar- Embark Book 1 today. The entire series, seven books in all, is available in ebook, paperback, hardcover, and audiobook produced and narrated by me. Amazon.com, search for Embark, John, J-O-N, Justice, or you can head on over to MyNerdWorld.net. So I hope uh, if you haven't already, you'll go and pick up your preferred copy for you or a friend. Uh, book one in ebook is available for just 99 cents. And if you happen to use KDP Unlimited, it's available for free on KDP Unlimited. So go and download it now. All right, thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. I hope wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, you are safe. Look forward to hearing from you between now and next week. Talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube. We'll talk to you then. Bye. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode and you are listening to... My... <laughs>